Motley Crue is a band plagued by drama, controversy, and tragedy. Today, we'll uncover the dark and untold truth behind the world's most notorious band, devoid of the fabricated tales they spin. By the end of this video, you'll learn the shocking details of the scandal that's currently posing a threat to the very existence of the band. But first, we need to talk about band leader Nikki Six and the controversial accusations of plagiarizing Motley Crue's distinct identity. Back in 1975, a 17-year-old Frank Ferrana embarked on a journey to Los Angeles dreaming of musical stardom. Before becoming the Nikki Six we know today, Ferrana joined the band Sister, believing he had found the perfect group of musicians to achieve his dream. His excitement, however, was short-lived, as he was swiftly fired from the band soon after joining. Although Sister never reached any significant level of success, Success, they gained notoriety thanks to lead vocalist Blackie Lawless's groundbreaking fusion of occult symbols with theatrical heavy metal performances, which just so happens to be the exact same aesthetics that Motley Crue would later take for themselves, leading Ferrana's former bandmates and sister to accuse him of plagiarism. But that's not the only thing he took from others, as when Ferrana legally changed his name, he did so by stealing the stage name of California musician Jeff Nicholson, who performed under the pseudonym of Nikki Six. In 1980, Ferrana, now known as Nikki Six, took part in an audition for a band consisting of Tommy Lee on drums and Greg Leon on guitar. However, things didn't go smoothly at first. Six stumbled in his first two auditions, struggling to even tune his own bass. Despite this, Lee couldn't help but see potential in Six and add advocated for his inclusion in the band. Eventually, Leon relented and welcomed Six into the fold. The nameless trio spent countless hours rehearsing together, but unfortunately, creative differences arose between Leon and Nikki Six. Six, with an unyielding commitment to his vision of the band, had assumed the role of band leader, leaving Leon no choice but to part ways. Undeterred, Six and Lee now found themselves in need of a new guitarist. Through a bold and audacious newspaper ad reading loud, rude, and aggressive guitar player available, they discovered the perfect fit in the form of Mick Mars. The guitarist proved to be a pivotal addition to the band, elevating their sound and propelling them to new heights. Lee then suggested recruiting Vince Neil as the band's frontman, bringing his own unique vocal style, charisma, attitude, and arrogance, which added a whole new dimension to the band's sound. Motley Crue's lineup was finally complete, and the band eagerly booked their first gig. It was all thanks to Six, who happened to work at the Starwood venue. He had somehow managed to convince his boss to give them an opening slot on April 24th, 1981. Little did they know, their debut performance would be met with rejection and merciless heckling from the audience. Neil, fed up with the disrespect, decided he had had enough. In the middle of a song, he leaped off stage to brawl with the crowd, and it didn't take long for the rest of the group to join in. Despite the chaos and hostility, Motley Crue powered through and completed their performance. By the end of the night, they had managed to win over most of their critics, turning them into diehard fans. We're here to give everybody their money's worth for the show and uh, play rock and roll Los Angeles style. And if people don't enjoy it, they don't have to come and see it. Throughout the remainder of the year, Motley Crue faced off against a rising Metallica in a fierce competition for dominance in the Los Angeles rock scene. Metallica would openly display their contempt for the hair metal subgenre and often took pleasure in mocking Motley Crue. I remember one night out in front of the Troubadour, we're standing there in our Iron Maiden t-shirts and it was like, after a couple of, you know, cold sort of slicks malt liquors or it was like you saw you like nikki and tom it was like motley crew i remember like nikki six started chasing after me and the one thing i could do because you know five foot six of me i could like run faster than he could in his 16 inch platform boots however the crew's vision of rock and roll couldn't be stopped their dominance in Los Angeles grew, while Metallica packed their bags and moved to Northern California, establishing the now legendary Bay Area thrash metal scene. With their first manager, Alan Kaufman, now by their side, Motley Crue set out to record
record their debut album, Too Fast for Love. Fueled by alcohol, they poured their hearts and souls into the music over the course of three intense days in October of 1981. Yeah, I think it cost us, what, three grand to make, and we did it in just a couple days. I mean, it was basically just a, a glorified demo tape. Nobody knew what they were doing, which is, I think is the beauty of that record, is why it sounds like the, the way it is. Everyone's just, we got in there, we're like, one, two, three, four, go. Like, nobody really thought much about anything. Nobody overthought anything. Everybody just played. The album, released just a month later on their own label, Leather Records, was an instant success. Selling over 20,000 copies, it caught the attention of several record labels. Ultimately, a deal with Elektra Records was struck in early 1982, giving Motley Crue the platform they needed to conquer the world of rock and roll. Elektra then released a remixed version of Too Fast for Love to coincide with the band's first ever tour. Cruising through Canada 82. The outing, however, was marred by a series of widely publicized incidents that would have a lasting impact. First, the band found themselves in hot water when they were apprehended at Edmonton International Airport. Customs officials deemed their spiked stage wardrobe to be dangerous weapons, and they were arrested on the spot. The night took a turn for the worse when a bomb threat disrupted their evening show, forcing the intervention of a law enforcement. Enforcement. And if that wasn't enough, Tommy Lee decided to take his partying to another level and hurled a television set from an upper story window of the Sheraton Caravan Hotel, resulting in the band being banned for life from the city of Edmonton. Motley Crue's rebellious nature had pushed the boundaries and now had tangible consequences. Despite the tour being a financial disaster, things began to take an unexpected turn. As news spread about the band's sensation, sensational and turbulent journey, their popularity skyrocketed. And though we now know that these three incidents were actually publicity stunts concocted by the band themselves, the media's coverage of Motley Crue's Path of Destruction made them a highly sought-after name by the year 1983. The band was now able to secure their most high-profile performances yet, an opening slot on Kiss's Creatures of the Night Tour. Their hard-partying ways however, proved to be their downfall once again. The band's behavior rubbed KISS co-founder Gene Simmons the wrong way, ultimately resulting in their expulsion from the tour. The roller coaster didn't end there, though. The band faced turmoil when it was unearthed that their manager, Alan Kaufman, had been deceitfully peddling supposed Motley Crue stock to unsuspecting investors. This discovery prompted the band to sever ties with Kaufman, paving the way for legal battles and Kaufman's eventual bankruptcy. Motley Crue then began producing their second album under the management of Doug Thaler and Doc McGee. Amidst the recording process, Six suffered a severe shoulder injury in a harrowing car crash, a consequence of his reckless joyride in a Porsche under the influence. To alleviate his pain, Six was given a prescription for the opioid Percocet, unknowingly paving the way for an agonizing descent into heroin addiction that would define his life later in the decade. In the aftermath of this crash, Six became the target of a mentally deranged stalker named Matthew Tripp. This disturbing individual firmly believed that he was hired as Six's body double and assumed his identity when his 1983 crash left him unable to perform in Motley Crue. Tripp's delusions run deep, as he convinces himself that he penned many of the band's smash hits, leading him to file a lawsuit in pursuit of the royalties he believes he's owed. Tripp's relentless stalking leaves Six fearing for his life at every turn, never leaving home without a firearm for protection. In the end, Tripp's lawsuit was ultimately dismissed. But for now, the band basked in their success after the release of the groundbreaking album Shout at the Devil in 1983, surpassing one million copies sold within a mere five months. The controversy surrounding the album's title track and provocative use of a pentagram on the album art further fueled their sales, with Christian and conservative groups accusing the band of promoting Satanism. The thing about Shout at the Devil was shout at the devil, shout at war, shout at anything that's negative, you know, and it was a real positive, it was supposed to be a positive message, but everyone took it 
You know, it was at, not with. Come on. However, as Motley Crue soared to the pinnacle of the music charts, their hedonistic lifestyles spiraled out of control and tensions started to crack the unity within the band. During their tour with Ozzy Osbourne in 1984, Motley Crue's abuse of alcohol and drugs reached unprecedented heights. I'm making two gallons of vodka a day? <laughs> Come Not on. Two gallons a no. day. No. I swear to you, dude, I swear to God. So you drank eight bottles of liquor? Yeah, a day. <laughs> for how long? Fuck, man, for a long time. However, Mick Mars, the band's oldest member, responsibly declined many late-night party invitations. In Mars's absence, his bandmates formed a connection with Ozzy Osbourne guitarist Jake E. Lee, even contemplating the possibility of replacing Mars with Lee. Luckily for Mars, Osbourne's bassist Bob Daisley wisely advised against altering their winning formula, leading Motley Crue to prepare for the 1984 Monsters of Rock Festival alongside rock veterans Van Halen and ACDC. However, unfortunate incidents occurred that left the crew on less than amicable terms with both bands. During a dinner, Vince Neil bit Eddie Van Halen, followed by Tommy Lee biting Malcolm Young. These guitarists, being vital members of their respective bands, were put at risk of an injury, potentially jeopardizing their performances. Frustrated, Van Halen and ACDC DC demanded Motley Crue be removed from the bill. However, due to the band's soaring popularity, such action proved difficult. To resolve the conflict, the promoter devised an unconventional solution. Upon their arrival at the concert venue, Motley Crue's trailer would be elevated several meters off the ground by a towering crane, effectively confining the band and preventing them from causing any trouble. By this point, Motley Crue had earned a notorious reputation reputation as the world's most destructive rock band. Stories of their mayhem spread to the extent that hotels insisted on a $15,000 deposit before accommodating them. Little did they know that the consequences of their self-destructive lifestyle were about to take an unforeseen toll, shaking the band to its very core. It all began shortly after the band returned home from tour, when a wild party kicked off at Vince Neil's house on on December 7th, 1984. The revelry lasted an astonishing three consecutive days, with the alcohol flowing freely until it finally ran dry. In his intoxicated state, Neil eagerly volunteered to drive to the liquor store in his sleek Di Tommaso Pantera sports car, accompanied by Razzle, the drummer from the band Hanoi Rocks. Tragically, on their way back home from the store, disaster struck. Unable to maintain control control of his vehicle, Neil crashed head-on into an oncoming car. The occupants of the other car suffered severe injuries, and while Neil survived the crash, Razzle tragically passed away in his arms on the scene. With each member of Motley Crue playing an irreplaceable role within the group, the future of the band now hung precariously in the balance. Their fate was now in the hands of the justice system, who would soon sentence Neil for his crimes. The lead singer of the heavy metal band Motley Crue was back in court today, he was ordered to begin serving a 30-day jail sentence for manslaughter and drunk driving. In a plea bargain arrangement, Wharton was ordered to pay $2.6 million to the two injured victims and to the estate of the passenger who died. This short 30-day jail term allowed Neil to generate income by continuing to tour in order to fulfill the civil suit requirements. But after serving only 15 days behind bars, Neil was granted parole for his good behavior, which was met with widespread criticism from fans and fellow musicians alike. In a gesture of remembrance, Motley Crue dedicated their 1985 studio album, Theater of Pain, to the memory of Nickel Razzle Dingley. Nevertheless, the band faced backlash in later years for the release of a box set titled Music to Crash Your Car To, deemed by many as a tasteless and disrespectful move. Even after all these years, Neil's 1984 crash continues to cast a shadow over Motley Crue's legacy. The incident strained the relationships between Tommy, Nikki, and Vince, threatening to pull the band apart. Engulfed in controversy, Motley Crue would never be the same again. We obviously had a horrible 
experience. You know, Vince had a horrible experience. Razzle's family had a horrible experience. Others were just, it was just a horrible thing to happen. You know, with Razzle's death and what happened with the band around that. There was a lot of sorrow and a lot of confusion. We just weren't sure what we were doing anymore. You know, there's no way around it. You know, it was, it was a horrible thing. I mean, none of us will ever forget it. Vince will never forgive himself. And, and um, it's, it's hard to explain. You just can't put it in words. Something like that happens. Despite the lingering tragedy of Razzle's death, Theater of Pain achieved remarkable success when it hit shelves in the summer of 1985. The song Smokin' in the Boys' Room skyrocketed as the band's first top 40 single, but it was the electrifying Home Sweet Home with its jaw-dropping live concert music video that truly stole the show. This instant classic took MTV's Daily Request chart by storm, reigning supreme for an unprecedented three months. In fact, its popularity prompted MTV to create what is now known as the crew rule, which dictated that videos must be rotated off the request line 30 days after their MTV premiere. While the album basked in overwhelming triumph, the members of Motley Crue look back on Theater of Pain with a tinge of disappointment. Turmoil loomed within the band over the recording sessions, leaving a palpable tension among the bandmates that refused to to dissipate anytime soon. As the band embarked on a world tour to promote the album, Vince Neil faced the added challenge of complying with the terms of his five-year probation, including the obligation to remain sober. Unfortunately, his bandmates did not offer much support, frequently tempting Neil to indulge in wild parties and excessive drinking. To Neil, this lack of solidarity felt like a betrayal. He couldn't shake off the feeling that any one of them, with their indulgent lifestyle, could have just as well been behind the wheel of a fatal crash. It was like, you know, guys, it's an accident, and uh, they didn't see it that way. While Neil battled his demons and fought to stay on a sober path, guitarist Mick Mars silently endured his own private hell. Diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis as a teenager, a condition that caused spinal inflammation, Mars resorted to self-medication with alcohol and painkillers. When you get the disease, you come from straight to being bent. It pulls you forward like this. To avoid further rocking the boat, he maintained a composed exterior amidst the internal strife. Unlike bassist Nikki Six, who was completely spiraling out of control. Raised in a broken family, with an absent father and an alcoholic mother, Six sought refuge in the band that became his family. But the pressures to keep Motley Crue together proved overwhelming, leading him down a destructive path of heroin addiction. On Valentine's Day 1986, fate dealt a cruel blow. Following a Motley Crue show in London, England, Six suffered a devastating overdose. His dealer, mistaking him for dead, contemplated disposing of his lifeless body in a dumpster. Yet against all odds, Six awoke from the claws of death. But this was not the end of his harrowing journey. Death lurked nearby as heroin continued to consume his life. With the release of their album Girls, Girls, Girls in 1987, the band's excess soared to unparalleled heights. Regrettably, Motley Crue seemed to have forgotten the lessons learned from Vince Neil's tragic crash. The singer had officially slipped back into his old ways, and the rest of the band spiraled deeper and deeper into drug and alcohol abuse, with Nikki Six sinking further into the abyss of heroin. Success, you know, gave us the ability to spend more money on recording time and on, on state on sets. It was, it was the same thing with drugs, you know. So when we were doing Too Fast for Love, you know, we could afford a little bit of stuff, and Shout at the Devil, we could afford a lot of stuff. And by Theater of Pain, we had roomfuls of stuff, and we were indulging in it, and it was starting to not work. Six goes on a night out with Slash and Steven Adler of Guns N' Roses on December 23rd, 1987. Yet, a fatal turn awaited him as he overdosed on pure Persian heroin. An ambulance is called to the scene, but it seems all hope is lost. Within minutes, Nikki Six is officially declared dead. It is at this moment that a Motley Crue fan among the paramedics decided to take a risk and administered not one, but two shots of adrenaline. 
Jackson. By some miracle, Nikki Six was resuscitated, brought back from the brink of oblivion. Sadly, this close call with an untimely death failed to serve as a catalyst for change. Within hours of leaving the hospital, Six succumbed to his demons once again and resumed his drug use. As the year 1988 came to a close, the members of Motley Crue were preparing for another highly anticipated European tour. However, their managers had a deep concern that if they allowed the band to travel overseas, one or more of them would not make it out alive. You know, our managers basically said, uh, if we guys send you to Europe what, with what you guys are doing, you know, someone's going to come back in a body bag. As such, they made the difficult decision to cancel the tour, and instead, insisted that each band member take the necessary steps to address their personal struggles. Vince, Nikki, Tommy, and Mick, who had dedicated themselves to relentlessly recording and touring for the past five years, now found themselves in a position where they either had to heal themselves or die. In 1989, Motley Crue took their first steps towards recovery. They entered rehab and engaged in group therapy to mend the wounds that had plagued the band. During this time, they recorded their fifth studio album, collaborating with producer Bob Rock in Vancouver, Canada, a location intentionally chosen to provide an environment conducive to sobriety. We moved to Vancouver to get away from the, the hustle of Los Angeles, just so we could just concentrate on the music and it's the best thing we've ever done. We just set up shop and we're like, we're gonna wake up and make music until we can't see straight and go to sleep, do the same thing over to tomorrow for six months. These substance-free sessions turned out to be incredibly fruitful. Inspired by his past addiction, Six penned the hit single, Kickstart My Heart, a triumphant rock anthem reflecting on his personal resurrection. The release of Dr. Feelgood in August 1989 marked a turning point for Motley Crue. Topping the charts, it became their best-selling record, selling over 6 million copies in the US alone. The subsequent tour to promote the album proved lucrative, earning each member over $8 million. Ironically, despite their newfound success, Motley Crue was on the cusp of a decline. Unbeknownst to them, their peak of popularity had already been reached, and their career was about to take a sudden downturn. But not before the band found themselves embroiled in a high-profile feud with none other than Guns N' Roses. It all started when Vince Neil made serious allegations against GNR guitarist Izzy Stradlin, claiming he had assaulted his wife, mud wrestler Cherise Rudell. The tension escalated to its breaking point at the 1989 MTV Video Music Awards. Ironically, right after Motley Crue presented the award for Best Metal Video to Guns N' Roses. As GNR took the stage to perform with Tom Petty, Neil couldn't contain his anger. He made his way to the side of the stage and delivered a punch to Stradlin, though security quickly intervened. This unruly behavior left Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose absolutely fuming. The incident led to an intense showdown between Neil and Rose, with threats being exchanged once security pulled them apart. It wasn't long before the whole world caught wind of the feud. Rose even went as far as to publicly challenge Neil to a fight, provoking a fiery response from the Motley Crue frontman himself. Well, anytime, any place. And right now, I want to put an end to this. And what I want is Axel, if you're watching this, I want to challenge you to a fight. I'm going to give you the time, and I'm going to give you the place, and there's no backing out now, buddy and it's time to put up or shut up. The conflict between these two rock titans reached such levels of anticipation that Eddie Van Halen himself offered to host the brawl at New York City's iconic Madison Square Garden. However, for unknown reasons, both Rose and Neil remained silent, and the epic fight was eventually forgotten. But the drama didn't end there. Motley Crue soon found themselves entangled in yet another behind-the-scenes feud, this time at the 
Moscow Music Peace Festival. The band felt their manager, Doc McGee, was showing favoritism to his other client, Bon Jovi, a band that the crew didn't exactly admire. Not only was Bon Jovi booked as the festival's headliner, but they were even allowed to use pyrotechnics during their performance, something Motley Crue had been strictly told they couldn't do themselves. As a result, McGee's tenure came to an abrupt end, as he was officially terminated by the enraged Motley Crue. The band would enter the 90s under the sole management of Doug Thaler, who, despite the band's desire for a break from the relentless pressures of the road, pushed them back into the studio to create their follow-up record, setting the stage for a disastrous chapter in their career. By this point in popular culture, the glam metal scene that had dominated the 1980s was fading, giving way to the rise of grunge music. Many of Motley Crue's peers were disbanding or witnessing their popularity plummet. Still, Elektra Records was expecting the band to somehow surpass the unprecedented success of their previous album. So in a controversial attempt to stay relevant in the ever-evolving music scene, the crew decided to veer away from their signature sound and venture into the realms of alternative rock. This this creative shift would prove contentious, particularly as it became apparent that frontman Vince Neil did not share the same enthusiasm as his bandmates. As his passion for the music dwindled, Neil found solace in alcohol once again, even as he embraced fatherhood with the birth of his daughter Skylar. Before long, Neil's excessive drinking began to impact his work ethic, leading to numerous missed recording sessions. Instead, he immersed himself in his newfound passion, race car driving, which further shifted his attention from the band. By February of 1992, band members Nikki Six, Tommy Lee, and Mick Mars reached a unanimous consensus that Neil was becoming a hindrance to their progress. An emergency meeting was called, resulting in the decision to part ways with Neil after his 11-year tenure with the band. The exact circumstances leading to this split remain shrouded in mystery, with conflicting accounts from the band members. Six claims Neil quit, while Neil himself insists he was fired just two days after his birthday. Whenever I see your videos, you're such an oh, integral part of the band. I don't know how the hell, how are you guys going on without you? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it came to complete shock to me and... Uh, just happened a few days ago? Yeah, just uh, actually two days after my birthday. It's like, happy birthday, Vince. Jesus. Yeah, but hey, that's okay. For the first time in over a decade, Neil found himself standing alone, facing an uncertain future. The Motley Crue Code had always upheld the belief that each band member was irreplaceable. Yet despite this, Nikki, Tommy, and Mick stand resolved to forge ahead. They must now confront the daunting challenge of finding a worthy successor to their iconic frontman. In September of 1992, the crew recruited singer John Karabi to replace Neil. There's, there was four ingredients. We took one fourth out and put a stronger fourth in. It's about totally. now. It's not about them. That's over. It's dead. It's past tense. You know, you can't live in the past. With Karabi as their new frontman, the band saw an opportunity to capitalize on his unique contributions. Six had never collaborated with another lyricist, while Mars had never played alongside another guitarist. With both of them curious to explore the possibilities of this fresh dynamic. You know, we split all the money equally, all the credit equally, and we just write. We call, we call it stew. And we couldn't do that with Vince, you know, because he couldn't write. With an unwavering commitment to replicating the success of Dr. Feelgood, the band embraced absolute sobriety during the album's recording. This militant approach included abstaining from drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, red meat, and caffeine, while engaging in daily physical training and nourishing their bodies with vitamin pills. Their efforts paid off, as the newly invigorated Motley Crue embarked on an inspired 
songwriting spree, crafting an impressive collection of 24 tracks in a remarkably short period. The band was so confident in the music they created that they made the bold decision to name the album after themselves. Thus, the album Motley Crue was born, slated for release in the spring of 1994. Meanwhile, the band's former frontman Vince Neil pursued his solo career and promoted his first album, Exposed. During interviews, Neil fielded questions about his departure from Motley Crue and expressed concerns that the band's new direction might alienate longtime fans. The way the music was going for uh, for the new Motley Crue album was really going too far away from from the stuff that we'd uh, you know the fans have grown up grown up and grown to love. And um, anytime I expressed my my disappointment with the music, I was like the odd man out, you know. And uh, so I really wasn't that excited about about the the new tunes. Despite Motley Crue's belief in their new material, the promotional rollout for their self-titled album fell flat. MTV, once a crucial platform for their music, blacklisted the band following an ill-fated interview where Six threatened to knock a host's teeth out. To make matters worse, internal conflicts at Elektra Records hindered the label's ability to effectively promote the crew's upcoming album. So when Motley Crue finally hit shelves on March 15th, 1994, it had been five years since the groundbreaking success of Dr. Feelgood, and sadly, the world had left them behind. The once popular group found themselves met with indifference, and it became evident that the commercial success the band had hoped for was highly unlikely. The subsequent tour also proved to be a disaster, compounding the band's public humiliation. Poor ticket sales forced Motley Crue to downgrade their venues from stadiums and arenas to smaller theaters and clubs. Despite the downsized venues, projected attendance was so poor that the tour had to be canceled altogether. These tribulations plunged the band into an uncertain future, quite a stark contrast from the dizzying heights of Dr. Feelgood. Similarly, Vince Neil's solo career failed to gain traction, while his personal life was marred by tragedy with the devastating loss of his four-year-old daughter, Skylar, to cancer. Motley Crue now found themselves crumbling under immense pressure from Elektra Records executives. With a staggering $50 million contract on the line, they were being pushed to bring back their former frontman, Vince Neil, in a bid to boost their dwindling sales figures. Enter Alan Kaufman, the band's new manager, who orchestrated a meeting between Neil and his former bandmates to determine the future of Motley Crue. The road to a possible reunion was filled with obstacles. Six and Lee still harbored resentment towards Neil, particularly for the tragic loss of Razzle. Despite their grievances, however, they had to face the harsh reality. If they wanted to recapture their former glory, they'd have to put their differences aside. So when 1997, the long-awaited announcement was made. The original Motley Crue was officially back in action. However, their reunion was far from smooth. Neil struggled to reconnect with his former bandmates when they entered the studio to record their seventh album, Generation Swine. I just got back in the band, still really weren't getting along with each other. I probably quit five times throughout the making of this, this album. Didn't want to be there. Adding to the turmoil, longtime producer Bob Rock was let go, with the band feeling that he had become too expensive and was overproducing their music. In his place came Scott Humphrey, a decision that would prove disastrous. Humphrey steered Motley Crue into experimenting with electronic sounds and glitchy guitar effects, leading to a clash with Mick Mars. The tension grew so intense that Mars contemplated leaving the band as Humphrey replaced some of his guitar parts with Nikki Sixx's recordings. Mars voiced his frustration, claiming that Humphrey's industrial textures didn't align with their hard rock sound. I didn't like any of the songs on that album. Actually, I had a really rough time. And every time that I would come up with a part, it was always wrong. And I always got criticized and my, my self-confidence went way, 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 way down. I'm still a little, it still, still eats at me. It still, it still does. Even when I go into, when I play on, when I play in live, when I'm recording a new record and everything else, I still have that self-doubt. 
from that. That was, that album me up. Six, influenced by Humphrey, started to believe that Mars was holding them back, driving a wedge between the band and their longtime guitarist. This marked the first instance of Mars feeling alienated within Motley Crue, but it wouldn't be the last. A full-blown war between Mars and his bandmates loomed on the horizon, but for now, they had to grapple with yet another commercially disappointing album. Upon its release, Generation Swine was lambasted by critics, deemed an outright embarrassment. Despite reuniting with Vince Neil, the album failed to catapult Motley Crue back to their previous level of success. The band grew disillusioned with their record label, Elektra, and severed ties in early 1998, citing a lack of support for their recent releases. Taking matters into their own hands, the band established Motley Records, gaining complete control over their music and building a upon their previous successes. Their journey to reclaim their musical throne, however, took an unfortunate turn when the actions of one band member led to his incarceration. After divorcing Heather Locklear in 1993, Tommy Lee married actress Pamela Anderson. Unfortunately, their marriage encountered a crisis in February of 1998 when Lee, during an argument about Anderson's parents, physically assaulted his wife. Late on Thursday in Los Angeles, Pamela Anderson Lee filed for divorce from Tommy Lee, who was arraigned earlier the same day on felony charges of spousal assault, child abuse, and weapons possession. Lee was jailed Wednesday morning and held on $1 million bail. Pamela told police that Tommy attacked her at their Malibu, California home late Tuesday night in front of their 20-month-old son, Brandon, while she held their seven-week-old son, Dylan. Tommy Lee's subsequent six-month jail sentence brought the band's comeback to a screeching halt, and Motley Crue was forced to decline invitations to high-profile events such as Ozfest and more. As Tommy served his time behind bars, he had ample opportunity for introspection. Reflecting on his life and future, he decided that he had made his mark in rock and roll history and sought something new. Following his intuition, Lee made the decision to depart from Motley Crue to launch his rap metal side project, Methods of Mayhem. With Lee's departure, the band enlisted Randy Castillo, a drummer known for his work with Ozzy Osbourne. But yet again, the absence of an original band member was palpable, as was reflected in the reception of their 2000 studio album, New Tattoo, which debuted at a disappointing number 41 on the Billboard 200 chart, marking their lowest position to date. The set Setbacks didn't end there, as Castillo faced health issues before the ensuing tour. Former Hole drummer Samantha Maloney stepped in as Motley Crue's touring drummer while Castillo focused on his recovery. However, a tumor was discovered on Castillo's jaw soon after, leading to a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. He tragically passed away on March 26, 2002. Following these tumultuous events and a string of album disappointments, the band decided to go on hiatus, leaving the world without Motley Crue for the first time in over two decades. During their time apart, the former members of Motley Crue each embarked on their own distinct journeys. Vince Neil, always one for the limelight, found himself in the realm of reality TV. Tommy Lee, on the other hand, branched out into the world of rap metal, testing the waters of a genre that was quite different from what he was used to, and Nicky Sick kept himself busy by forming various new rock bands. But amidst the busyness of their individual pursuits, one member of the iconic rock band was noticeably absent, Mick Mars. Lost in a fog of illness, depression, and prescription drug addiction, the guitarist had vanished from the public eye. Just when it seemed as if Motley Crue was destined to fade into obscurity, something unexpected happened. Their tell-all band autobiography, aptly titled the dirt struck a chord with readers everywhere. The band suddenly found themselves back in the spotlight, capturing the attention of a wider audience. Nikki Six seized this moment and embarked on a mission to reunite the band, starting with Mick Mars, whose whereabouts proved to be a challenge to uncover. Yet upon finally locating the guitarist, Six was met with a jarring sight. Mars had become a mere shell of his former self, consumed by his addiction to painkillers. 
years. With his weight plummeting to a mere 80 pounds, sporting a beard flowing down to his chest. Mick hasn't let anybody see him. He's really, his health is beyond deteriorated. He's 103 pounds. He's depressed, beyond depressed. He's so, you know, so thin and frail and, and he's um, sort of pulled into himself and... Well, you know Mick. Mick hates, hates everything and every doctor and every... Yeah. He's not gonna go. I've been trying to get him to go to a doctor for five years, you know, to go see a specialist and he has always felt like he's beyond hope and I don't think that's the case. Six convinced Mars to seek medical treatment to confront his depression and health issues head on. It became clear that Mars would also need to devote significant time to regain his guitar skills. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, the members of Motley Crue devised their master plan to reclaim their place in the music world, setting their sights on a monumental reunion in 2003. However, Six threw a curveball by delaying the crew's reunion to tour with his newly formed side project. Brides of Destruction. This decision did not sit well with his bandmates, particularly Vince Neil, who threatened legal action for breach of contract due to the postponement. Finally, in 2005, Motley Crue made their long-awaited comeback with the release of Red, White & Crew, an epic compilation album that marked the beginning of their triumphant return. The band embarked on a world tour of unprecedented proportions, thrilling fans worldwide. However, this era of Motley Crue wasn't without its challenges. A controversial incident involving Neil's on-air obscenity during a live performance on The Tonight Show caused an uproar and led to an FCC investigation. Motley Crue found themselves banned from NBC, sparking a legal battle that was eventually settled out of court. Troubles continued as the band sued Tommy Lee's manager for involving the drummer in two unsuccessful reality TV shows. Embarrassments that the band claimed tarnished their image. Yet the most damaging blows came from mounting accusations of lip-syncing, claims that only intensified when Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich openly criticized Motley Crue for performing to a backing track at the American Music Awards, reigniting a decade-spanning feud between the two bands. Although it is widely understood that televised musical performances often involve simulated elements due to time constraints, Nikki Six took offense to Ulrich's comments. The bassist responded with a scathing open letter that oozed with insults and animosity. However, Six notably did not deny the use of backing tracks in their shows. Despite the controversies surrounding their live performances, Motley Crue defied the odds in the modern era. Their 2009 album, Saints of Los Angeles, marked a renaissance for the band, reaching new heights on the US mainstream rock charts, with the title track becoming their second highest charting single. Capitalizing on their radio success, the band created Crewfest, a traveling musical festival that not only commemorated the 20th anniversary of Dr. Feelgood, but also celebrated the next generation of rock bands. However, Nikki Six would become involved in a heated feud with one of the younger bands on the tour, revealing a possible inflated ego over the years. According to Godsmack's lead singer, Sully Erna, Crewfest was marred by Six's diva behavior, earning it the title of the worst tour Erna had ever been a part of. The frontman channeled his frustration into the Godsmack song, Crying Like a Bitch, denouncing Six's prima donna rock star attitude. I I I'll say it straight out, I've never met a bigger f***ing dick in my life than Nicky Six. He's a douchebag. He is straight up a f***ing douche, and I don't give a f*** what he says. He knows exactly where I am, and he knows exactly how he can find me anytime that mother has the balls to come and look me up. He's just so pompous and egotistical, and he feels like he's still on top of the world. He just thinks he's so relevant, and he's just an old, fat, washed-up has-been. He annoys me, and I, I don't even, you know... I don't even deal with it anymore, it's just, it's lame. Then, in 2014, the band would shock the world when they revealed their decision to embark on one final tour before disbanding forever. We want to go out with the four founding members of Motley Crue and go out on top, you know, and just, and leave a legacy of, uh, of 
of a band called, called Motley Crue. As other legacy bands had developed a reputation of announcing breakup tours only to reunite later for profit, Motley Crue took things one step further by publicly signing a legal agreement that would prevent them from touring under the name Motley Crue beyond their last tour. This bold move, however, was nothing more than an act, as following the release of the Netflix film adaptation of Motley Crue's biography, The Dirt, the band announced their reunion through a video in which they destroyed their previously signed cessation of touring contract. Fans who had invested substantial amounts of money to attend the band's supposed final shows understandably felt cheated. Nevertheless, the band justified their reunion by stating that the success of The Dirt introduced their music to a new generation of fans. Fans who deserved to see them live. The reformed Motley Crue, consisting of six Lee, Neil, and Mars, embarked on the stadium tour with Def Leppard and Poison in the summer of 2022, selling tickets for up to $2,500. Scathing media reports highlighted instances where the band unintentionally exposed their continued use of backing tracks, including one notable incident involving vocalist Vince Neil. Despite these slip-ups, the stadium tour proved to be the most lucrative of Motley Crue's four-decade-plus career, generating a staggering $173.4 million. But beneath the facade of success, a storm was brewing within the band, paving the way for the most scandalous chapter of their career. In October of 2022, Motley Crue's management dropped a bombshell, announcing the retirement of guitarist Mick Mars due to his unyielding health struggles. The situation raised eyebrows, with former crew frontman John Karabi pointing out the lack of a personal statement from Mars himself, hinting that something was amiss. Karabi went on to reveal that Mars hadn't even played on Motley Crue's most recent albums, as guitar duties were secretly taken over by DJ Ashba, a collaborator of Nikki Six in his side project 6AM. Finally, on April 7th, 2023, Mars broke his silence with the industry-shaking announcement that he was suing Motley Crue, claiming that his former bandmates had forced him out in order to seize his shares in the band's business interests. Under oath, Mars claimed that he was the only member playing his instrument live during the 2022 stadium tour. He accused Nikki Six of manipulating him psychologically making him believe that he suffered from cognitive dysfunction and that his guitar skills no longer met the band's standards. Mars also disclosed that Motley Crue presented him with a, quote, take it or leave it severance offer, reducing his 25% equity to a mere 5%. Six allegedly had the audacity to claim that Mars was lucky to receive even that much. Motley Crue fired back, asserting that Mars quit the band after struggling to remember chords and playing the wrong songs on stage. As the lawsuit remains embroiled in litigation, Motley Crue decided to forge ahead with new music, officially bringing in John Five as their guitarist. Whether loyal fans will embrace this newest iteration of the band remains uncertain, as history suggests that past albums released without all original members have suffered dismal sales. Nevertheless, Mars remains determined to profit from from Motley Crue into the future. As he defiantly stated in an interview with Variety, I helped build this band for 41 years. It's mine. I'm keeping it. You can't have it. I'm not gonna let anybody take it from me. <laughs> 